So, so this wing of the building does two functions. One, it supports the emergency operations center in the, uh, in the event of a disaster and then day-to-day -day operations. And so I'll, I'll walk you through that. Um, the first one is this is uh, one of our detective's offices. Hi, Vera. Um, the closet to the right that you see there actually opens up and it, it turns into an extra radio bay station for us. Mm -hmm. This would be for our disaster groups in our area, mm -hmm. the handheld uh, mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. Radio folks would uh, work out of this, uh, this area here. Um, this office here, this is our briefing room. Okay. So this is where all of our officers meet uh, before shift to go over mm -hmm. those 67, the 5% I talked about, anything unique in the three communities. It could be quality of life issues, special mm -hmm. uh, points of emphasis. We talk about it here. Mm -hmm. um, we put a lot of our just basic literature in this room. Mm -hmm. This is also um, a, a training room for us as well. Mm -hmm. This room here is the uh, watch commander's office. Um, I really like this office because they decided to put that window there. On the other side is the officer's report writing room and they did it so they can just make sure the officers are doing what they should be doing. It's okay. kind of, it's, it's a unique feature. But uh, the watch commander is in charge. It's the sergeant in charge of the shift. Mm -hmm. What we did is we added two supervisors to our shifts mm -hmm. for the three communities. And so now we have more supervision out on the street mm -hmm. on any given time or day of the week. Mm -hmm. And it's very important because if, if you bring up or you show me a mistake in police work, I'll show you a lack of supervision. And so it really starts with this group. They need to be on the ball, the best trained, and they need to be out in the street. And that's, what we, that's how we've set up our operation. We've worked it around them. It's all about supervision. And so it's, it's in the center of our building. Um, this is the, the center point for all of our officers. Mm -hmm. They need to know where the supervisor is at all times and, and get the answers they need. Are all officers... Uh trained at the same level when they are hired? Absolutely. They, they go through the police academy? They go through the police academy and they go through a four to five month field training program. Uh -huh. And then, um, and then from there we have them, and then it's really we we build them up to to our philosophy of policing because as you know, cities have different philosophies mm -hmm. on policing, mm -hmm. and, and it's very important. It's usually a two year training process. Um, so and they are all just we have an outstanding group. Um, did, did, did your philosophy of po policing? Uh, was that uh, pretty much the same as San Anselmo's philosophy? Was it, were there adjustments? There were adjustments. There are adjustments. When we get upstairs, I'll talk about it, because okay. I wanted to show you our organizational values, because that's cool. what we're built on. Okay. Um, this is our, uh, our, um, our kitchen. And again, it's a day-to-day. -day. We use it uh, for mm -hmm. breaks. But mm -hmm. it's also used if the emergency operations center was activated. Mm -hmm. This is where we would uh, have our food. Mm -hmm. We have two sleeping quarters mm -hmm. in our building. Mm -hmm. Sleeping quarters, sleeping quarters have two uses. If there's an emergency, we can be here 24-7. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two of them. Uh, but also, our officers work 12-hour shifts. Mm -hmm. And so let's say they get off at uh, 12 in the morning, or I'm sorry, they get off at 6 a.m. in the morning and they have court that day, and they live in Petaluma. Mm -hmm. Instead of driving to Petaluma then to court, that's dangerous. They can stay here, sleep, and then go to court. And so um, they use this uh, probably five times a week, maybe. Really? And it's a and great resource. Oh, that, and it's safe. That seems really difficult yeah. for an so. officer to have sleep here. Yeah. Um, they're comfortable. <laughs> here this may not seem like a lot but this building wasn't bricks and mortar. When we started to talk about Measure E it was about what do you want and our, our, our community wanted a state-of-the-art facility that had those, those redundancies. The, um, the technology mm -hmm. to take policing to the next level. Mm -hmm. Computers in the cars. Mm -hmm. If there's a pursuit. Um, and, and I'm the sergeant on duty, I can actually pull up my computer and I can watch that pursuit. I can see it real time, Be right? When there's a pursuit, you're listening, before we listen on the radio, okay, how fast are they going, where are they going, what is the crime, should they continue? You're constantly evaluating, you know, should this continue with the, the safety of the public and the apprehension of the suspect? Is the officer under control in their voice? You know, and, you're, and that's all you had. Now, you know, we're going to the technology of, you can see them. You can actually see what they see in their car. Oh, right. We have maps, and I'll show you them when we get to dispatch, that you can see where they are. Mm -hmm. How fast are they going and where are they going? Are they headed 80 miles an hour plus through the downtown of San Anselmo? We need to know that, and, and so we can shut it down. We can make good split-second decisions. And so our technology gives us that infrastructure. Um, if this building were to fall to the ground, all of our systems have backups in Novato, mm -hmm. and then our Novato location has backups through a virtual network to Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have three redundancies to our systems. Like I said, if this building came to the ground, I could actually continue operations with a laptop computer. 
Um, I can communicate with my managers in three different cities. I can communicate with my officers out in the field and see what they're doing real, real time from my house. And, and that, that's redundancies. We want to be here. Let's, let me just uh, reaffirm or uh, hear that again. So right now, the San Anselmo Police Station is still manned. Uh, uh, 24-7. 24-7. Someone is always there. Okay. Yeah. We actually added more. There are more police officers in that building 24 hours a day, seven days a week than ever before. In, in the history, yeah, and it's important, and it goes to how we've set up. We've made mistakes, but we know we know what we need to do and how we need to deploy our people. And so, yeah, absolutely, that is a real live working station, okay. and important to how we police. Okay. Something else that's important to note for San Anselmo and Twin Cities: um, before at any given time, you may have um, two, three officers out on the field, and when you had someone in custody, and this happens a handful of times a week, mm -hmm. you would be off the street handling those officers and you'd have to pull in extra officers because we didn't have the right security systems and holding cells for those people. Mm -hmm. And so you would go three hours at a time with no one out on the street in San Anselmo because you're dealing. This building now, we can control multiple suspects with two officers and we don't have to pull four or five officers off the street to handle that. And so this is, this is a state of the art um, holding cell. Hopefully no one's in here. Nope. And so a couple things. You notice the greenness. You walk into a room, the light automatically comes on. The light comes on, we walk in. We are being audio and videotaped right now. Anyone in front of a computer can see us right now. Dispatch is monitoring us. This is important because it's transparency. Something bad happens in this, it's recorded. We can watch it. We have two holding cells. We have two interview rooms. Again, two officers can handle up to four suspects at any given time. In the past, if we had four bad guys, we'd have to bring in four officers. Mm -hmm. So this, this is home field advantage. It gives us the capability to keep people out in the street okay. where they need to be, but secure suspects at the same time. Some other security features that we have. This is our, this is our it's called a sally port. And so um, when, we, when we have an arrestee and we bring, we'll bring them in here, this door comes down, they're secured. The officers then will bring them into the booking area for um, scan, live scan. Mm -hmm. The important thing to note on this is we are away from everybody else. Our community is safe right now in this building because the bad guys can't get to them. And that's important. The other facilities didn't have that. San Anselmo didn't have that and doesn't now. And so we can support that safety feature here. If an officer is overtaken, um, as they pull a suspect out of a car, you see the, the red buttons, it's technology. They can hit that, those are low because the officer theoretically would be on the ground. They can hit that, an emergency beacon goes to every officer in front of a computer or who has a radio. A GPS beacon comes out and we know they need help here. Um, so the safety features are outstanding in this building. Next door, I actually don't have clearance to get into it, believe it or not. It's a, um, it's an evidence room, and so if we have vehicles, motorcycles that need to be processed for evidence, they can be stored here. Uh, San Anselmo last year had an incident where um, a suspect shot a, a live uh, firearm into um, a commissioner's house. We identified the suspect, we, um, we looked for him, we ended up finding his car, and we towed it to the courtyard because that's where San Anselmo police stored cars. He actually found it, stole it back out of the corporation yard, and then called the police department and mocked the police department. And that's the perfect example of, um, of why it's important to be able to secure evidence when you have it. We didn't have this before this building. We have it now. He wouldn't be able to steal it. Unluckily for him, I like to note that he was arrested 24 hours later, and so we got him and his car back. But it's just a point of being able to control and be safe with your evidence. You know, that wasn't safe for the public works guys in the courtyard, and it wasn't secure. And so this building, uh, the little things, it provides that. Uh-oh. Something else that we have, uh, it's called live scan. It's, a, it's interfaced with the state and FBI systems, and so now we don't have to use the, uh, the old fingerprinting system. We can identify someone immediately with the, with the technology of LiveScan. And so it's another feature that we have uh, that's very helpful. In the past, if you fingerprinted someone and sent it up to the state, it could take six weeks to confirm who, the identity of that person. Mm -hmm. We can do it now in a matter of hours. So. What is LiveScan? LiveScan is a fingerprint machine. Yeah, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
This is our, um, you may have heard it like the, the CSI show. This is our, this is our crime lab. I, again, I don't have the authority to get in there, but uh, it's just a small room. It's uh, maybe six feet by eight feet. And we, we, that's where we identify, if we have uh, evidence in burglaries or crimes or blood evidence, mm -hmm. it's stored here and we have technicians on site that can uh, process the evidence. And, and are you doing that regularly here? Uh, absolutely. Uh, no, ab absolutely. Next to it is the uh, evidence room. And these are temporary. What happens is if, if an officer has evidence, mm -hmm. they'll bag it and tag it here. Mm -hmm. They'll put it in the temporary evidence lockers and then it's secured on the other side. Mm -hmm. Another important thing, evidence. You get in trouble as a police department, it's evidence. You have to be able to track it, know it, and where it is at all times. The other buildings made it difficult at times. This building now houses all the evidence for Central Marin Police Authority. It's stored here and also on the other side. Um, from the janitor's office all the way to the glass right there is another large storage area. And so a lot of the downstairs, what you'll see, is storage. It's storage to keep stuff on site. At our old building, we didn't have enough storage. We actually stored evidence. At a, at a rental uh, shed in Corte Madera in Larkspur, offsite. It cost us money on for rent, and it, was, it wasn't a totally secure location. And so now we can keep everything here. Again, one of our, uh, we have four detectives. Uh, we have, this is another detective's office. Mm -hmm. Just a basic um, little working area for our officers. Mm -hmm. We have two lieutenants now in our command structure. Um, Lieutenant Moneris is in charge of uh, patrol operations, the officers here at Larkspur. Mm -hmm. And then we have Lieutenant Smith, who is in San Anselmo, stationed there 24-7 uh, for patrol operations there. Just another, uh, it's just uh, quickly, you know, officers go to briefing, they come down, they have their mailboxes, their radios, they have their patrol bags, and then they can just go straight out the door. interview rooms so if you're a victim of a crime it depends what type of crime if it's a sexual assault domestic violence we have a room an interview room here it's a, it's called the soft interview room and what we do again you don't have the old window now where everyone can watch the interview you're being audio video recorded now and anyone in front of a computer can see it and again it's just a soft interview room to make a victim feel uh, comfortable and safe um, and you know be interviewed and do what we have to do so and again they're safe from the other side it's locked no one can get in mm -hmm. and then if you're a victim of let's just say it's a um of an auto burglary or a, a, an assault we have two interview rooms they're just basic interview rooms but same thought it's just a table and a chair and, and we can okay so Something else we had, you asked me earlier, did we have anything in mind for expansion? And this is where it came into play. Measure E paid for technology, and part of that technology was uh, dispatch. When we, when we um, had to move from our old facility into a temporary facility for the construction of this building, we had to house our dispatch center somewhere else. Um, and it was gonna cost us about a quarter of a million dollars to do it. San Anselmo had the same dispatch concepts and equipment and um, and options for us and so they reached out to us and said hey we'll let you you can house your dispatch center with us for one dollar a year and that started the story now of one the consolidation but two dispatch and so now measure e paid for a half a million dollars worth of equipment for a dispatch center mm -hmm. but what we did is we got state grants for a half a million dollars and we used that monies mm -hmm. to build this center mm -hmm. to offer a chance to expand in the future to give us options mm -hmm. um, and the options are um, it could be anything. It could be from San Rafael to the Golden Gate, you know, just one dispatch center. Oh, you know, well, the sorry, capabilities I'm, 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 to actually do it. Like, tell me that again. You're saying that you have the funds available we to actually have expand? The, we actually have the capabilities right now with the state grants that we have oh. that, that I'm about to show you. We actually have the capabilities to dispatch from San Rafael to the Golden Gate. We have the resources and technology oh. and equipment in this building right now oh. to do that. And it just gives us flexibility and options moving forward. Right. But I, I, I want to say that your uh, options to not to build another. We no, it's here now. Yeah. It's here now. And the other important thing is th those were decisions like that not to use public funds. This was a bond measure, mm -hmm. and and knowing that you know Quarter Madera and Larkspur residents are paying for that bond measure, mm -hmm. it was important to use other funds mm -hmm. to give us when we thought about options mm -hmm. to use funds for those options, mm -hmm. not the bond funds. This was a twenty million dollar project. We came in at $18 million. We just, um, just finalized it. We're giving back $2 million back to the bonds to pay them down. And so we were six months ahead of schedule. 
We saved $2 million and paid it back to the citizens. And again, it just goes along the lines of doing things the right way. Great. And I think it, it goes to like what you touched on of the oversight, mm -hmm. having a lot of people looking at this thing and making sure, asking the tough questions and holding you to it. And so mm -hmm. it's exciting. But this dispatch center will show the technology that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. We're on the other side of the lobby now again. Pr uh, pr ballistic glass, but you also want it uh, friendly and approachable for community members. Um, we have someone that, that, that is up here um, during the business hours. If an emergency happened, the, the office here, this position, this is the dispatch supervisor's office, mm -hmm. and you have three consoles here, they can all support each other and answer the same phone calls. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a big disaster, you know, you'll get 100 calls within five minutes, they can all support each other. We've never had that before. Mm -hmm. And it's a great resource. It's a really good setup. It's, it's the voice over internet mm -hmm. voice technology that we have. Mm -hmm. um, if there was a disaster that happened, we could just each, you could just go down the hallways and everybody can support everyone on the phone systems. It's just a really great network and system. Mm -hmm. Hi, gals. So this is our dispatch center. It looks like you have a couple we have three full stations here. What a full station is, is it doesn't matter if it's coming from Corte Madera, Larkspur, or San Anselmo, they all can do the same thing from each station. Mm. The supervisor's office is a four station. She can act as a full dispatch center too. So if, let's say we had two disaster, two incidents at once in two different mm -hmm. communities, we have the capabilities to handle it. Um, here. We have more resources here than, than say the city of uh, San Rafael right now, um, which has a bigger population and more calls for service. And I guess it's everything a, would be uh, Wi-Fi dependent, uh, pretty much? Or no, what? we're in the fiber. So what oh, we do is it's about redundancies. And so if there's a disaster and cell phone towers, cell phone towers went down, we mm -hmm. could lose communications. Mm -hmm. We're in the fiber optics. We're in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so this system will not go down. It's more secure than a basic hard phone line, so if you had to compare it. They're under the ground? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, up top, when I talked about like the security cameras, when we went into some of the offices, mm -hmm. Dispatch um, will will view uh, our monitors, the mm -hmm. middle monitors, 24/7. Right. They rotate. Right. Over here, off to the right, you can see um, it's connected to the internet. It shows you where all the units are on any given day, and you can see the resources that we have. And this is over right there on the right. Yes. Screen. Yeah. San Rafael, please. Right. Yeah, it's what, uh, so there's San Rafael, San Anselmo, oh, okay. Fairfax, and oh. uh, Corte Madero, Marksburg, all Central Marin. Uh, we can see each other. Each, uh, so same center. systems as you, as you asked earlier. Yeah. We have GPS mapping, and so you you can see where the cars are at any given point. If you get a 911 call, mm -hmm. it'll automatically show you. Uh, it's at Sir Francis Drake in San Anselmo, mm -hmm. you know, and so then we can map it out and see where the officers are. Mm -hmm. You get a disaster. You have to set up a perimeter. Mm -hmm. You could actually set up your officers around a, a specific location. Mm -hmm. um, the technology is just really amazing um, with our infrastructure here, mm -hmm. and so it's well. it's exciting where it's headed. You know, it's how you use it. All right, Pretty good. Um, okay. Okay. Now, is, there some, is there upstairs? There's too? just an upstairs, but it's really quick. It's really okay. quick, and then we can get. Uh, okay. So downstairs is dispatch. It's evidence and um, and um, storage, mm -hmm. uh, patrol. Upstairs is the support services side of the operation, and so it's my myself. Mm -hmm. It's the detectives. Mm -hmm. It's my captains, mm -hmm. in the locker rooms. Again, something else that's neat, like you look on the outside and you see the two cupolas or the towers and right. you go, what are those? Yeah. You know what they are? They're natural light. Oh. Here's one right here. Oh. During the day, if you weren't here, we, I would have all these lights shut off because we have natural light yeah. on both sides and up top. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's not built to be gaudy, it's built for natural light. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we conserve energy. In our old facility, we paid about $20,000 for PG&E. Mm -hmm. It was 5,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. This is 17,000 square feet and we pay the same amount. Eric Glass, Glass Architects. He's uh, out of Santa Rosa, he's amazing. Mm. Um, and he was the one that did the needs assessment in 1999. Mm. And he stayed with us all the way through. Just really quick, this is a fast one. Um, the three offices to the left are our detectives. Mm. I have my two captains. A police department is, is, is set up of administration, that's the chief, mm -hmm. support services and patrol. And mm -hmm. so I have the support services and patrol captain here at any given time. I have a, a support services lieutenant. Our sergeant is here. Mm -hmm. 
And again, just really quickly, I have the men's locker room to the left, mm -hmm. women's locker room to the right. It goes all the way down. And then what we also have, I just wanted to point out, so this is our training. This is our training room. People thought it was a basketball court. It's actually a training room. We do defensive tactics training in here. And we also, you know, it's about physical fitness. We want our people to stay in shape. And so before or after work, we can have people here. Mm -hmm. We are also getting, um, it's called a, 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 sim a simulator machine. And what it'll be is it'll have three, wall, three screens that'll come down. And it's about transitioning from your taser to your firearm to using your voice mm -hmm. to going hands on. Mm -hmm. um, it's the BART incident, the Meserly case, you know, you, you have an officer has four hours of training and then they go out on the street and they get in this critical incident, it comes to muscle memory. Mm -hmm. It's transitioning. And it's not something you can do over four hours. It takes a career to, to really learn it and know it. And so we take it very serious. And so we're going to have um, training and machines like that that'll support us on a daily or weekly basis just to run our personnel through to really learn that muscle memory and give them the skills that they need. And so this room is very important. The other thing that I forgot. There we go. Test, test. Got me? Yeah. I think the other thing that um, I needed to mention, it's about, it's about money and it's about training. Training's the number one issue for us. Mm -hmm. Money probably being the number two. Um, this building, we now bring uh, Peace Officers and Standards and Training does our training in the state. They mandate and monitor our training. Mm -hmm. We now host training regionally here in our building. Oh. What that means is we don't have to pay for it. Our officers can get trained by in-house here and we save about $25,000 a year doing that. And we basically bring this built people to our building to do the regional training because it's state of the art and we have the facilities to support that. And so it turns into a money maker it's for part us. Of the, like, Accreditation as if they were part of the police academy, or are they in the, in the training process, or are these already officers who are? So post, post certifies training, and so let's say it's use of force training. They certify that training program, but we can host those trainers here mm -hmm. and actually train our people and train others in this region mm -hmm. at this facility. Because post, they need the facilities to put on the trainings, and so now we've become one of the regional areas for that training. And so it's good. We don't have to send people away and pay for them. They can come here. We save 25000 and we actually you know, train our people on site. And so this room and then downstairs in the community room are the two areas that provide that training. Well, that's an interesting yeah. uh, so it's a neat topic to touch base on. I'm not sure right now we're kind of, um, well, we've um, been doing quite a bit of uh, touring here. Uh, but I had wondered about the training, and uh, particularly in, in, the, in the realm of sort of psychological in terms of for officers to know perhaps uh, methods of disarming a person psychologically as well as, well as mm -hmm. physically in mm -hmm. terms of allowing somebody who may be mentally, you know, mm -hmm. stressed or whatever you know, do you, do you, are you involved in that? Is there anything going on here with, with this? Absolutely. There's a couple, there's a couple things. One, um, when the special response team is called out, they're called hostage or crisis negotiators. Mm -hmm. uh, we have four of them uh, within our agency. Mm -hmm. You get any incident like that, mm -hmm. the most important people aren't the ones with the guns. Mm -hmm. They're the ones with the voice. Mm -hmm. And it's those, those, those crisis negotiators. And so we take that very seriously. We have four highly trained people that mm -hmm. do that for us. Mm -hmm. And they're attached to that special response team mm -hmm. on those major incidents. But how about, the, how about just the exactly. regular on and, the beat? And, and so situation? that's how it started. Okay. And we started to say, God, when we have these, these life or death, these critical incidents, and we have you know, people that are unstable with guns and knives and, and what's going on here, and we started evaluating the calls. And this is over a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. There, there are people with mental issues, you know, mm -hmm. mental and, and unstable, you know, psychological problems. And so interestingly enough, in 2008, we actually brought it and supported it, uh, got the support of the community, said, hey, with Measure E, we want to also support services. Mm -hmm. They supported a school resource officer for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. The second thing was crisis intervention team training. It's psychological training um, for those that are um, psychologically, that have psychological issues talking, communicating, identifying it as an officer and figuring out how you're going to proceed and handle that incident. It's called crisis intervention training. Mm -hmm. The base course is 40 hours and then it continues on an annual to biannual basis for officers. Mm -hmm. 
the community said that's very important and we think you need to as a police department you need to be aware of that because it's not about just shooting it's not about shooting people it's about you know solving an issue in a safe manner and that's key to the training number one issue for our community mm -hmm. and uh, so now we actually have training annually it's supported by Measure E and so yes most agencies you'll have uh, 20 percent of their agency is trained in CIT training our whole department is trained and they're not just trained once if the training continues on an annual to biannual basis and so uh, very important it's probably one of the most important uh, training programs out there right now for police officers it's identifying that psychological makeup that issue and then how do you work through it from start from point A to point B to successfully resolve it without using force Is or hurting there a, someone there's a, a specific uh, place school or an instruction team that handles that where does that uh, training take place uh, we it's it's we're able to do it um, within the county and so they'll come they'll come to us but yes there's a specific program to it a specific instruction, a certification, um, and, and it evolves every year, right? It's, it's what ha what's happened that year, and God, you know what? We need to advance our training, you know, lessons learned, and so it's constant. It's really good. It's, you touched on the most important thing uh, for us as officers and what we do. It's that. That's it's critical, and, oh, yeah. and, and we've, we've supported it financially, and, and one of the things is you'll see at a lot of places when the budgets go bad, what do we do? We freeze positions, and we go, let's just let's push off training. You know, let's, we'll do it next year. We can only do so much. You can't. You can never push off training. And mm -hmm. so, you know, having a training program like that supported financially by a measure mm -hmm. and, and really as a community going, no, you are expected to train, police department. This is our expectation of you. Um, it's, it's great. And um, it's, it's, we've been very successful with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Can we go ahead and pause for a moment? I think we, we, we must be uh, coming up on the 30 minutes.